Okay, if I asked you to make a list of the great American culinary hits, you might include regional barbecue or maybe layer cakes, apple pie a la mode, southern cornbread. But in terms of ingredients, American ingredients, you'd have to say peanut butter. Well, in the Middle East, of course, they use tahini, which is made from sesame seeds, not peanuts. But the thing about tahini is it has a slight bitterness and savoriness to it, so we like to use it as an ingredient. And we're going to make some Turkish meatballs today at Milk Street with a sauce that has tahini in it. And then my favorite recipe of all time, tahini swirl brownies. Chocolate and tahini really go together. So today on Mill Street, we're gonna take a page from the Middle East and make some great recipes inspired by tahini. Stay tuned and hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Mill Street. So um, we're doing kofta or kefta, which are little North African, we can say meatballs or meat patties, Turkey, Morocco. Many years ago, I was in Morocco, Marrakesh, and at night in the big square, they would grill meat over a fire. They use a uh, spiral skewer with a very long handle and a wooden handle at the end. And then I went back a few years ago, and at night, now they have tents, it's, it's much fancier. <laughs> and they have displays of all the food they're grilling. But they made the kofta in patties and served them with some chili oil was really, really good. And one of the things I noticed was in Morocco, they don't, they don't use spicy spices. They use uh, cinnamon in them. They use allspice. So it was very mild, but the chili oil gave a little mm -hmm. zip. So today we're going to make kofta or kefta. How would you say it? Kofta. Oh, you do it so well. <laughs> uh, these are very easily made at home. And you can also just make an entire meal out of it as well, which I often do. So we've taken out the skewers from this. Once you take out the skewer, we had one problem, which was dealing with the toughness. So we're going to use an Italian technique, which is a, making a panade, which is a bread paste. And that really helps add some moisture and softness on the inside. In this recipe, since we're going to be eating it with pita bread, we're going to use pita bread for our panade. And I have in here one eight inch pita that I've torn up. And then we're going to add to that a quarter cup of yogurt. And it's important here not to use Greek yogurt, but plain whole milk yogurt. And then I have a quarter cup of water here. And now's the fun part, Chris. You get to get your hands dirty. This is why I had to wash my hands before I came up? <laughs> okay. So what you're gonna do is just get right in there and mash that up to a nice, even paste. What happens with this is with the water and the yogurt and the, essentially the starch and the bread, it gelatinizes. You get a gelatinized starch and that holds on to liquid, which is nice, which doesn't dry out the meat. It also makes it harder for the proteins in the meat to bind together so it's more tender. Mm -hmm. So you get a tender and moist meatball, and it'll come together really quickly. It's important that we use fresh pita bread for this. We found that the flavor and the texture was far superior than stale pita bread, and since we're using it to eat, to have fresh pita bread on hand. This is fun. It's nice. I like it's like, it's like I'm not going to stop. I'm going to do this for the next half hour. <laughs> well, while you do that, I'm going to move on to doing our spice mixture. And for this, I'm going to start with two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, about two tablespoons of shallots, chopped fine, and then I have one clove of garlic that's been grated. And then for our spices, we have dried oregano, one and a half teaspoons. I have some cinnamon, also one and a half teaspoons, and cumin, one and a half teaspoons. It's warm and earthy flavors that we're blending together into our so spice So you split mix. the difference between Morocco and Turkey, essentially. Essentially. Yeah. And I'm going to give this a quick mix, and then really here we're going to draw out the flavors into the oil by microwaving this mixture for 30 seconds on high heat. Okay, so you did a pretty good job with the panade, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to add the rest of our ingredients to this. So I have here one and a half pounds of ground beef. You can also actually use lamb and a lamb and beef combination for this. If you did, then you'd use one pound of lamb and a half pound of ground beef. But we're going with beef, all beef today. This is finely chopped mint, I have one cup of it. That's gonna add a lovely herbaceous note. And this is our seasoning mixture that's now been cooled with the shallots and the garlic and all those lovely spices. 
And then I have here one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt and one teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. And so far, I've made the panade and moved the bowls. That's, I think I moved the That's bowls exceedingly well. Very well. So now I'm just going to mix this. This is where I get to get my hands dirty to make sure all the panade and the seasonings and the herbs are combined. I mean, have you noticed that in America, nobody eats lamb? I think it's under a pound per person. Beef's, what, 70 or 80 pounds per person? But North Africa, Middle East, a lot of people eat lamb for a lot of reasons. In many of the recipes we do here, maybe half beef and half lamb or lamb itself, especially with spices, uh, where it doesn't taste too strong. It's, it's just delicious. a wonderful meat. I, I should start the lamb council. It's very good. It's a delicious meat. And I think if it's cooked properly with the right spices, it's, it's not lamby. So this is nicely mixed, Chris. And now we're going to form our kofta. So I'm going to use an ice cream scoop and we're going to make 12 portions of the meat. Those are pretty big portions. Well, I'm a hungry lady. So I would love to get your help now, Chris, in rolling out the meatballs. Memories of Play-Doh. You're gonna give them a little bit of pressure. For me, that's a longer memory than it is for you, <laughs> I'm afraid. If your hands are a little wet sometimes, it makes it easier to roll out. So we're gonna finish these up, and then I'm going to refrigerate them for 15 minutes to let them rest, and then we'll get to cooking our kofta. For most of us, salad dressing means vinaigrettes, a mix of oil and vinegar. But we wanted a little more variety here at Milk Street, and we found an Iranian dressing that we really loved. It's by way of Yasmin Khan, who's the author of The Saffron Tales. And the dressing is called Sikanjabeen. It's an ancient blend of cider vinegar, honey or sugar, and fresh mint. Reduced as a syrup, it makes a wonderful dressing, but it's also great diluted as a refreshing drink. In a small saucepan over medium heat, combine half a cup each of honey and cider vinegar and half a teaspoon of kosher salt. Simmer until large bubbles appear and the mixture reduces to about half a cup. Off heat, add one ounce of fresh mint, both leaves and stems. Push them into the syrup and let it steep until it reaches room temperature. This allows the mince flavor to really come through. Strain the syrup into a bowl, pressing the solids, and then stir the remaining two tablespoons of vinegar and let it cool. This final flourish of vinegar curbs the dressing's sweetness. This dressing is great on cooled roasted vegetables like cauliflower, carrots, and eggplant, as well as on bitter broccoli rab. And it can be refrigerated for up to a month. So Chris, our meatballs have been sitting in the fridge for 15 minutes, they've rested well, and we'll cook them in just a second, but first I want to make our sauce. So for the sauce, I'm going to use one cup of whole milk yogurt. To this, I'm going to add three tablespoons of tahini, which is something we love at Milk Street. We even put it in our brownies. Three tablespoons of lime juice. And that's going to add some tang. A quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper for yeah. a little kick. And then a half teaspoon of kosher salt. Give that a little whisk. This is a really tasty but very easy sauce. And that's it. Couldn't be simpler. Now to cook our kofta, I'm going to heat one tablespoon of olive oil on medium high until it just starts to smoke. These are going to cook for five minutes on either side. I'm going to press them down gently with a spatula so we get a little bit of flattening. So we're going to cook these for five minutes on each side so that we develop a really nice crust. And then we'll be ready to eat. All right, so these look ready to eat, so I'm gonna turn off the heat. I love this smell. You know what, these work really well as also are as hamburgers. What, for little tiny people? <laughs> what is this like? What are you calling me, Chris? Are you calling me short? No, I'm just saying you don't have a big appetite for the big burger, that's all. I like petite things. Would you like a plate, Reina? Yes, please. Yes, I Thank thought you, you might like much. one. How did I know that? Some pizza? Thank you. So to build these, we like to put a little bit of sauce inside the pocket first. And smell the mint and the oregano. And then we have vegetables here. We have sliced tomatoes, sliced cucumber, some red onion, flat leaf parsley. All right. Okay, now we have to eat this delicately. <laughs> Mm. So we're having 
Memories of Marrakesh. This, this is very much like the Moroccan because it's not really spicy. It has the little warmth of the cinnamon in it. I love the sauce. I can taste in the texture the effect that the panade has had on the meat. It's really tender and soft, even though we cooked it a fair bit enough to get this nice crust on the outside. So today at Mill Street, we learned how to make meatballs the Turkish or North African way, kofta or kefta. Nice spices, cumin, oregano, a little bit of cinnamon. And we also put a panade in. It keeps them nice and moist. You cook them, even if you cook them too well done. And instead of on a skewer, like they would do on the square Marrakesh, we just did it in a skillet and uh, didn't take hardly any time at all. Great job, great dinner, uh, a great lunch, or a great breakfast. Thank you, Raina. <laughs> You're welcome, Chris. Here at Milk Street, we've learned that if you want to know how people really cook a recipe in their own country, you have to go to that country. So we did exactly that a few months ago. Jason Hirsch, our editorial director, went to Tel Aviv to find out how the Israelis and Palestinians make hummus, very similar but slightly different. And it turns out when he came back, he said, in this country, we make it wrong, we serve it wrong, and we eat it wrong. It turns out hummus is served for breakfast and also lunch in a bowl. It's served warm, it's whipped, it's very light, has more tahini than we have here. And it's definitely not a waiting pool for crudités before dinner. That's definitely out. So we brought the recipe back to Mill Street and worked on it just a bit. And today we're going to show you how to make the real deal. This is excellent. It's totally different than what you buy in the supermarket. That's right, Chris. This is a completely different animal than what you find in the grocery store. It wasn't until Jason actually went to Israel that we really understood that the ingredients matter a lot here. So this is not the time to pop open a can of pre-made beans. It's really tempting, and we actually tried making it with canned beans, but then when we took the time to actually soak some dry chickpeas, the results were totally different. It was creamier and lighter and had better flavor. And you can see these are actually kind of small. When you're at the grocery store, you'll likely have just one type of dried chickpeas, and that's fine. But if there are a couple options, you want to go for the smaller chickpeas. So we have these eight ounces of chickpeas, and we soak them in eight cups of water. Now to that water, we add two tablespoons of kosher salt, so it makes kind of a brine. And you want to soak that for at least 12 hours. What's nice about this is you can do this ahead of time. So you can soak your chickpeas, drain them, and put them in a zip-top bag for up to two days and keep them in the fridge. Once these are soaked, we're just going to go and drain them and then come back. Okay. Okay, Chris, so we drained our chickpeas. I'm gonna add them to 10 cups of water. We also have a half a teaspoon of baking soda in here, and that's gonna help soften the skins of the chickpeas. Well, we should explain once and for all why you put salt in the soaking yes. water. The outside of beans is very hard, the skins, and they have calcium and magnesium ions. And so it's hard for the water to get in, so by the time it gets into the center and cooks the center of the bean, the outside's overcooked, and that's why the skins come off. If you put salt in the water, the sodium and chloride ions replace some of the calcium and magnesium, makes it easier for the water to get in, it cooks them more quickly. The outside doesn't overcook by the time the inside is cooked, so you get even cooking and you get a smoother texture. So salt the water when you soak beans overnight or for six or eight hours, you get a more evenly cooked bean. And that's, that's that. Settled. Okay, so we're just gonna let this simmer for 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll come back and we can make our hummus. Okay, Chris, so we just simmered our chickpeas for about 45 minutes until they were nice and tender. And before I add them to the food processor, there were two tips that we picked up in Tel Aviv when it comes to the actual processing of the hummus. And one is that you want your chickpeas to be warm, and the second is you want to process them for a full three minutes. Now, that feels like forever, so I'm actually going to set a timer to make sure that we give it the time to get really light and smooth. So I'm going to add the chickpeas. And I also have a teaspoon of kosher salt. Set the timer. That was the longest three minutes of my life. Right? <laughs> it feels like a long it time, feel but it's going to make a big difference at the end. Another thing that we learned in Israel is you want to use a lot of tahini. We're going to add three quarters of a cup, and it has a really nice nuttiness to it. Put the top on, and we're going to process this for another full minute. We're almost done, I promise. With the motor running, I'm gonna add three quarters of a cup of that reserved chickpea water. It's gotta be nice and warm. And then I have three and a half tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. And you just blend that until it's combined. Look at how beautiful that is. That looks nothing like that coarse 
sort of dog food consistency you get. I'm sorry, but that stuff in the supermarket is just, people actually eat this in a bowl warm for breakfast. It's not a side thing, it's not a dip, it's, it's breakfast. Okay, Chris, so now we're gonna garnish it and make it look really pretty. And I have two to three tablespoons of olive oil here. Next, we're gonna add a half a teaspoon of paprika. And I mean, you can get creative with how you wanna make your garnishes look. Another half teaspoon of cumin. And then before we process this, I set aside two tablespoons of whole chickpeas. Mm -hmm. So you can show that we're making this with a real deal here. You can see these beautiful cooked chickpeas. And then a sprinkle of fresh parsley. That looks great. You just wanna dig in with a spoon. But we actually have warm pita bread. Can we eat this now? Yeah, or dig, in. Talk about dig in, dig okay. in. I'm gonna get a little bit of all these toppings. Mm. I mean, it is so light mm -hmm. and fluffy, and the tahini gives it flavor. It's pretty interesting, too, because mm. this recipe has so much flavor, but there's no garlic. We didn't add any oil until our garnish. It's so basic, really, but it transforms into mm. this beautiful dish. So today at Milk Street, we did something a little unusual. We got on a plane and went to Tel Aviv to figure out how to make authentic hummus. We started with dried chickpeas, not canned, cooked them after soaking them overnight. And the secret really was to whip them for three minutes. We used a timer to get them nice and fluffy, added some tahini, cooking water, lemon juice. So you end up with warm, light hummus. It's delicious. You can also top it with a spicy beef topping or olive oil or cooked chickpeas. Thank you. Excellent. And now I need to eat this entire bowl right now. Let's do it. So Erica, we're doing brownies yet again, because we've done them before, but with a twist. You know, actually chocolate wasn't that available in the 19th century. So That's if you so go sad. back to Fanny Farmer's time, her cookbook in 1896, there were almost no chocolate desserts because mm -hmm. it was very expensive. That's mm -hmm. why Boston cream pie, sponge cake with a custard filling with chocolate on top, was actually a rare and expensive treat at mm -hmm. the time. Since then, of course, chocolate is everywhere, but we decided to do something a little bit different, which is to combine tahini with chocolate. Um, actually, there's a bakery in Boston that serves halva brownies, which mm. is very similar. So instead of peanut butter brownies, we'll make tahini brownies, which are just sesame seeds, roasted sesame seeds, turned into a butter. Yes. And that's going to be wonderful. Yes, it is. Okay. It's actually a really nice combination of the bittersweet tahini and the sweet chocolate brownie. It really elevates these. You know, it's like a more mature brownie. Well, a lot of people are doing desserts now. There's, there's a combination of bitter and sweet together, mm -hmm. which I think makes it much more interesting. It does. Sweet on sweet's nice, but bitter with sweet's right. better. Right, yeah. exactly. So we're going to start with the chocolate part of the brownie. We're just going to melt four tablespoons of salted butter. I'm just going to put this in a saucepan. I'm just going to melt this over medium heat. All right, so this is nice and melted. Go ahead and turn that off. To this, we're going to add four ounces of chopped bittersweet chocolate and three tablespoons of cocoa powder. And these two together give us a really nice, deep chocolate flavor. I'm just gonna whisk this up. And we do this off heat because you know we don't wanna burn the chocolate. So the heat of the melted butter is enough to melt the chocolate up. And if you wouldn't mind giving that a couple more whisks, we can let it sure. sit as we move on. Now I'm gonna make the brownie base. We have three eggs. And to that we're gonna add one cup plus two tablespoons of sugar. And then I'm gonna add a tablespoon of vanilla. And that may seem like a lot of vanilla, but it really brings out the chocolate flavor and it also pairs really well with tahini. And then a teaspoon of kosher salt. You know, when I'm baking now and it says a teaspoon of vanilla, I just put a tablespoon in. Yeah, I, just find I know, it. it's a wonderful yeah. thing. So we're just gonna whisk this pretty well. You wanna whisk it until it starts to thicken. It's gonna take about a minute. And what this does is really start to um, dissolve the sugar and that gives you that nice little crackly crust. It's so good on a brownie. So, so far, it looks like we're just making your regular brownie, brownie. basic brownie, right? We haven't done anything too exciting, but that's gonna change. Now we're gonna add our tahini. And we found three quarter cup tahini was perfect in this recipe, I didn't make them too greasy. And before you measure out tahini, you always wanna make sure to incorporate it and stir it really well in the jar. Sometimes it tends to separate out and you'll get a like natural peanut butter or unsweetened peanut butter does. And the top layer of oil. And it's also very thick sometimes. Yes, yeah. just gonna whisk that together. Okay, and our last ingredient is just one third cup of all-purpose flour. That's all we needed to hold these together. And we should point out we're not the first people to make a brownie with tahini. No. Uh, tahini is used with chocolate. I mean, quite a few recipes I've seen, so. Ours is the best. Yes, but ours is the best. Thank you for mentioning that, yes. <laughs> 
Okay, so before we add our chocolate to this, we're going to reserve a half a cup of this batter. Okay, now if you could just hand me that chocolate. Is it nice and melted? It's nice and melted. Good to go, all right. Oh, we're gonna do this as a team, I like it. <laughs> well, you get the fun part, I just get to hold the. If this is as much fun you're gonna have today, Erica, <laughs> you're having a bad day. I know, right? That's great. Got a lot? Yep. Okay. All right, now I'm just gonna stir this together. Another great thing about adding the tahini to the base is it really made these brownies moist and chewy. We have our pan prepared. Now, as you can see, we have our pan. It's an eight inch square pan, and we've lined it with two pieces of foil. But we've also buttered the inside of the pan because it's such a sticky, gooey brownie that it tended to stick a little bit, so. It smells great already. Do we have to cook What's, it? Wh well, wait a minute. Now, are you gonna let your kids taste it? No, no of course not. not. So I'm just gonna smooth the batter into the corners. Now for this part that we had set aside, we're gonna dollop this uh, reserved tahini batter on top of here. And the reason this works so well is because the tahini is not just plain, it's actually incorporated and it's got the eggs and it's got the flour and so it actually stays put where it's supposed to. And it looks pretty, so. I do nine dollops. All right, now we're gonna create a really pretty swirl. I find it best to use tip of a paring knife. It's nice and sharp and makes a nice clean design. But you do want to be careful. You don't need to put it all the way down the bottom because you don't want to cut the foil. You just need to run basically through the top half of the batter. It's like shoots and ladders. <laughs> yeah. I remember that game. And I just give it a 90 degree turn and I just do the same thing. Hmm. And that's it. Okay, so this is ready to go into a 350 degree oven on the middle rack. This takes about 30 minutes. And it's important to remember that you don't need to underbake these to make them gooey. They've got that tahini in there to keep them nice and moist. So you wanna make sure they're fully baked. And the best way to test this is by just sticking a toothpick, you know, inserted in the center. You wanna make sure there's no wet batter, just a few moist crumbs attached. Okay. Okay. So you ready? <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty silly. So these have been cooling for two hours. You want to let them cool when you take them out of the oven for 30 minutes while they're still in the pan. And then you just want to lift them out of the pan and let them continue to cool in the foil for another at least 30 minutes. Uh, so ready to take off the foil. You can see why greasing the foil is important. I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer. Evidently. I, I... <laughs> All right. Now, I'm gonna use a grease knife to slice these because again, they're gooey and a little bit sticky. So we like to cut these into two inch squares. You might like yours a little bigger, but today- I you, might. You're gonna- <laughs> All right. Have at it, Chris. So should I have an, an end piece? Oh, yes. Whatever you want. Oh, we'll each have a little end piece. This, this is, yeah, fudgy. Yeah, you can see it's fudgy, it's super moist. Mm. And you can really taste the tahini. I love brownies, but it's just that sweet and sweet isn't nearly as good. And this isn't, it isn't bitter, it's just roasted. Exactly. It's kind of interesting. It gives you a base for the chocolate and the sweetness, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's fabulous. If there are any leftovers, these actually do taste better the next day. The tahini flavor really comes through a little bit more. There are not going to be any leftovers <laughs> Probably here. not, but no, this I is... just thought I'd mention it. So today at Mill Street, we learned how to make a brownie, but we made a brownie with tahini. You put the tahini into the batter, reserve some of that batter, swirled it in at the end so you get some on top, right. and then also throughout the batter. So by the way, if you want to get all the recipes from this season of Mill Street, go to our website, which is MilkStreetTV.com.